Hello, everybody. Jim here with you again for another one of these talkie videos, whatever the hell they're called. Conversational. I think that's what we settled on. Conversational video. I'm just going to talk to you. I'm just going to ramble for a little while. Uh, unscripted. It's, uh, oh, what the hell was it? It's uncut, uncensored, and uncooked. It's raw. Uh, it's raw, baby. Um, going in raw. Um, yeah. Gonna sit here and talk to you all. Uh, I got a, a beer in hand. It is Suntory the Brew tonight. The cheap stuff, because I'm being a cheap skate right now. But still, beer nonetheless. And, um, it's October. And, uh, getting a little chilly out there. So staying warm in my nice, cozy little Tokyo apartment. And tonight, I'm doing uh, a video on uh, something that was requested by a fellow by the name of Mike Merle. Uh, Mike's a cool guy. Uh, buys a lot of video games from me. And he says, you know, I'd love it if you did a, a video talking about the state of retro gaming in Japan. And I said, you know, that sounds like a good idea because that's something I don't really touch on very much. You know, I make my videos, I do my reviews, game hunting and all that, but I don't really talk about um, sort of the, the popularity of retro gaming in Japan or how it's embraced by uh, Japanese gamers and such. Uh, mostly uh, just because I don't, you know, I don't want to speak for anybody else. Um, so I will just talk about uh, what I have observed and sort of like, I guess, the key differences between retro gaming in Japan and in North America, uh, especially as it pertains to uh, YouTube. And uh, I think the, the major difference that I've, ob I've observed, because I went and I looked at um, a bunch of retro game Japanese channels, trying to kind of get a feel for what they're all about. And I think a key difference between retro gaming in Japan and on YouTube, well, in Japan and in America, is that a lot of the retro gaming Japanese channels, they're more about um, just like straight gameplay. Uh, let's plays and speed runs and things like that, and streams as well. Um, there's not really like I mean there are some channels I found very few though that are more into the collecting aspect of retro gaming more so I found a lot of channels dedicated to completing games like no death runs and completing like speed runs and high scores and um, gameplay seems to be like uh, the most important thing for the Japanese retro gaming YouTubers and I think that has a lot to do with because um, there aren't really what another thing I've observed is there aren't really like retro gaming like personalities so much in uh, Japanese YouTube whereas in North America there's a lot of that um, I mean, as soon as YouTube launched there was angry video game nerd and then other people following behind him and there was kind of like the whole normal boots crowd with like John Tron and um, what are some of the peanut butter gamer and and then other people like you know uh, Pat the NES punk and then just endless endless retro game reviewers retro game like YouTube collectors um, people that like all their videos are just about like pickups videos and hidden gems and things like that it's uh, there's not really very many videos of them just sitting there and like playing a game they're either like a character or it's more about like their personality or how many games they have or or something like that or them just talking to you about a game you know for a few minutes which to be fair is mostly what I do too uh, reviewing games and doing pickups videos and game hunts and stuff like that there aren't that many let's plays on my channel but when you go to most Japanese retro game channels that's mostly what you'll find are let's plays and speed runs and uh, streams and things like that and I think that has a lot to do with um, like the retro game personality in Japan at least as far as as I know 
for the longest time has been Areno, who is the host of Game Center CX. And that's basically what Game Center CX is. It's comical, but essentially, it's like Let's Plays that were made for TV. I don't know how long that show has been, been running. Um, I, I know it's definitely well over a decade. But that was the whole point of that show, is that this guy sits down and plays really difficult games for, you know, the Famicom and PC Engine, Mega Drive, whatever else. I mean, they took, you know, they do a whole lot of different consoles, but that, he was kind of like, or maybe still is, I, I think he's still fairly popular, still shows up at TGS and stuff like that, but he was kind of like the cornerstone, and his show was sort of like the cornerstone of retro gaming in Japan, and it's, it's just him, like, playing games. They, they never focused in the, in the uh, episodes about the rarity of this game and, and anything like that. And so I see, like, a lot of Japanese YouTubers, they also don't really focus on that. Um, it's more about uh, playing the game and playing it well and less about um, game collecting and pickups videos and stuff like that. There's less of that and more of the gameplay. Whereas when you think about, like, YouTube personalities from North America, uh, you think kind of the opposite. There's more of the, the presentation and the personality and uh, the game hunting and stuff like that. I think of channels like um, uh, like Game Chasers and like the NES Pursuit and all that stuff where it's all about game hunting. There's not so much like gameplay, like Let's Plays and things like that. It's more about game hunting and it's more about those guys like hanging out together and their personalities and, and how they play off of one another. And again, characters like AVGN and the Normal Boots, uh, all those reviewers and things like that. Um, so I think that's really a key difference between, at least in terms of YouTube, retro gamers in North America and retro gamers in Japan. There seems to be like a really different focus when it comes to uh, retro game channels. And I think that kind of carries over into like the the collecting aspect of retro gaming because um, a lot of people have pointed this out like when I do like videos in Akihabara when I do go on my game hunts there looking for stuff uh, a lot of the um, uh, the people that are in the retro game shops like Super Potato like uh, Trader and uh, Retro Game Camp it, it would seem like there's more tourists than actual Japanese people in those shops at any one given time. So a big part of the game selling market in Japan is selling to like not just like tourists but uh, selling uh, online and things like that. Um, I know this from experience now because as soon as I I um, announced that I was going to be selling games as well I, I've gotten like so many messages, so many requests on Facebook and, and uh, Instagram and Twitter and it's you know it's people from uh, the US from Canada from various parts of Europe from um, you know Mexico and other parts of Central and South America lots and lots of people that just uh, for one reason or another they don't have immediate access to Japanese games so they're they're buying online they're going to eBay they're going maybe to Play Asia or Japanese Amazon or, or things like that or Yahoo auctions and using um, like mail proxies in that are uh, in Japan to have stuff shipped to them. Um, so a big market for game selling in Japan is to sell to people who are not from Japan, who don't live in Japan. You either sell online or tourists come through. Um, a lot of people, part of their tourism here is game shopping, and they drop a lot of money on it. And um, so I've noticed that a lot. I mean, there's still plenty of Japanese game collectors. Even like when I go to um, uh, A Button in Akihabara, if there's a, a crowd there, you know, sometimes we could sit down and if we had picked up some games that day, we could sort of like take them out. You know, everybody shows what they got and you, know, you talk about games and stuff, talk about collecting and things like that. Um, so there are collectors and that is like a part of the retro gaming um, I guess culture of Japan, but I think a bigger part of it is uh, more so playing the games, less so uh, collecting them. Um, even like, uh, there have been times when I've gone to uh, parties that my friends were having at their house, and I just brought along like a Super Famicom with me with, uh, you know, some games you could play multiplayer like Mario Kart and Street Fighter 2 and a couple others. 
And usually what I would get from my friends is like, wow, uh, a Super Famicom, like I haven't played one of these in like decades. Um, they sit down to play and they still like are absolutely masterful at, you know, Mario Kart and uh, Street Fighter 2. Um, so, you know, they're not, they don't collect video games, they don't actually own any retro games or anything, but as soon as they picked up the controller, it was like, wow, they really put a lot of time into these games. Um, so they can play them just as well as they could when they were kids. Um, despite the fact that they're not collecting them, you know, they're not doing let's plays and speed runs and and pickups videos and stuff like that. They just they pick up a controller and it's like they're right back where they where they started. And um, so yeah, that's I think that's something I notice. Collecting is still like a thing in Japan. Obviously, prices are uh, going up just like everywhere else. But I think a bigger aspect to the retro gaming community in Japan is uh, game play, not so much uh, game collecting. And uh, I think that the kind of the opposite is true in the United States. And while there still are plenty of like speedrunners and um, let's players and things like that, um, there's also just a huge, huge uh, glut of retro game YouTube channels that are almost entirely dedicated to uh, pickups videos and like uh, hidden gems and reviews and all that kind of stuff um, and they're less so focused on actually uh, playing video games for their audience so uh, I think that's a key difference I think that says something about the state of uh, retro gaming in Japan because even when I go to like the uh, the arcades where there are plenty of retro games uh, just recently was at the Kawasaki warehouse uh, which is a great, great arcade with tons of retro games, and unfortunately it's shutting down uh, next month, I guess due to, um, you know, poor business. And when we went there, there were like a ton of people there, because as soon as they said the arcade was closing, people were like, what? Well, we better get down there and and uh, have some fun before they shut it down. And, I mean, what we saw were people just, like, uh, I, I was sitting there in awe just watching a guy playing, uh, art. I think it was R-Type 2, and he was just like beating our type like no death run pretty much with one hand he would just position himself in the perfect position on bosses and things and then just sit there and just tap the fire button and nothing could hurt him and he would just be checking his phone and beating our type like hardest freaking shooters of all time and he's basically just beating him with one hand while checking his phone so I think that says something about there's, there's not so much the attachment to, like, f the physical media and, like, collecting games and things so much as as just playing the games and being, like, as good as possible at them. And uh, I think that carries over into retro gaming uh, Japanese YouTube channels. And I think that also shows in um, when I go into retro game shops, sort of the makeup of the, the customers that are there. Um... Yeah, so Mike, I think that's that's sort of the state of retro gaming in Japan. Um, people are still big gamers. They are not as much uh, game collectors, although that does still go on. Prices are going up just the same as in North America and Europe. I know it's a thing all over the place. Um, retro game collecting has just become kind of an expensive thing, and maybe it's going to peak and it'll uh, turn around sometime soon. Um, but again, you know, for the people that will say that it's all about, you know, the, the retro game YouTubers and stuff, they're the ones that are driving up prices and everything like that. I don't know, because Japanese prices are going up too, and there's no, as far as I know, there's no Japanese equivalent to Metal Jesus, or AVGN, or, or any of those other, like, big name, you know, retro game YouTubers, and the prices still go up anyway. So I think just, just whatever the market demands, what people will pay is what people will charge. Um, and that's just kind of my two cents on it, but that's that's the the state of, of retro gaming in Japan as best as I can approximate it um, Playing retro games still Popular sort of the godfather of retro gaming still a Reno and uh, Game collecting still expensive still a thing, but not as big a thing I think as it is in in the US um, at least when you look up, look at the makeup of, of uh, Japanese retro game YouTube, I think that's something that you'll take away. You'll see way more Let's Plays and speedruns than you will uh, pickups videos and things like that. Uh, anyway, I do encourage everyone to, um, if you do like this channel, go and look up some of those 
uh, Japanese retro game channels. Just uh, in the search bar type, you know, well, I mean, I I'll put it in the description, just the word uh, retro game in, uh, in Japanese and katakana, and you can just copy and paste it into the search bar. And go have a look at some of the channels. You'll see some expert game players uh, really crushing some games. Um, and, so, you know, it's some pretty impressive stuff. Really great gamers, uh, Japanese gamers on YouTube. Uh, just don't expect to see, um, you know, the Japanese AVGN uh, anytime soon. Uh, anyway, uh, that's it. Thanks, uh, Mike, for, uh, you know, posing the question and, and uh, getting me to sit down and record this. And uh, everybody, thanks for watching. Um, I'll go ahead, you know, this is the ass end of the video, I'll just plug all the social media stuff, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Patreon, go and check them out, links are always in the description, uh, everybody thanks for uh, sticking around, uh, we're well over uh, 16,000 subscribers right now, uh, which is crazy, uh, about a month ago I was saying thank you for 15, and now here we are at like 16.3, and uh, that's really awesome, so thank you. Um, you know, a channel doesn't grow if its viewers don't want it to. So I appreciate uh, everybody that watches, likes, shares, all that good stuff. Uh, so thanks everybody for listening. I hope you enjoyed my ramblings. I'm going to get back to this beer. And uh, that's it from me for now. So thank you everybody. Take care and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.